I was asked to say a little. <laughs> I was asked to say, I'm, let me start again. I'm Summer Gentry, and I am really happy to be here. Um, I met your professor uh, through the INFORMS healthcare meeting. So INFORMS is the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences, which is our professional society um, that you still get involved with. But I will tell you about my education, how I got to where I'm going, how I got to where I am, and a lot about my research and the kinds of things that you might be able to get involved with after you finish your education. So I went to undergraduate at Stanford University, and this is after growing up in Southern California. So I was really glad to get to stay in California. And I studied mathematical and computational science. That was my undergraduate degree. And I also got a master's degree in operations research while I was there. So I really enjoyed operations research. I kind of attached myself to it because I'm the kind of person who has a million different interests. So I wanted to be a novelist and a journalist and I wanted to build rocket ships and I wanted to do math and I loved everything. So operations research was like this opportunity to always have the option to change into a new field because operations research was this toolkit, flexible toolkit, where I knew how to solve problems. And so people from different disciplines would come to me and bring me their problems. So I'll tell you about some of the things I worked on early in my career. I, I, I was in a program where almost everybody in my program went into finance when they graduated. But as I learned, the finance industry wasn't for me. It didn't feel very ethical. And also the working conditions were very bad. And I just didn't think that like I would be making the world a better place working in finance. So I said, okay, I know how to do optimization and simulation. I will never work on a problem where the goal is money. I will not work on anything with the objective that is measured in dollars. So I went to uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs so I wanted to work on science and I ended up doing a few things. One thing that was like a graph theory, computer networking uh, security thing. But the one that I really loved was working on nuclear non-proliferation. So we had just signed the START treaty with the Russians, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. The goal was to destroy uh, a bunch of nuclear weapons that the US and uh, the Soviet Union had built. So to prove that we were destroying our plutonium-based nuclear weapons, we had to take the weapons-grade plutonium and mix it together with other isotopes of plutonium so that you could not separate them again and make it into a bomb because it's very hard to separate the isotopes of plutonium. So we were gonna mix all these things together. So we had um, some, some plutonium from like spent nuclear stocks and some plutonium from like experiments and some plutonium that was designed for bomb making material. And we had to mix them all together in this big mixing vat uh, and turn them into these ceramic pucks and they were going to bury them in the ground at Yucca Mountain. Well, so there's already an operations research problem there when you have all of the different streams of material coming in. And you want to figure out, well, how big does the mixing vat have to be? And at what rate am I feeding in from all of these different sources? So that after I mix it up, I'm sure that the eventual hockey puck plutonium is not uh, nuclear grade and it can't be turned into a weapon. But not only that, we kind of didn't know what was in each of the streams. So we had to use simulation and a probability distribution over what we thought were the isotopes in some of those streams. And, and the explanation that I was given was, well, this can is just whatever they swept off the floor at Hannaford, which is from the early days of US nuclear experimentation. So they weren't quite sure, they hadn't characterized exactly what was in there. In any case, so then I used a, a technology called simulation. I, I'm sure that you're all learning a lot about optimization and simulation, is that right? And last semester we talked about that. Yeah, they had a course, we talked about application of uh, operational research. So, did, but did you have, you had a course on simulation? on no, they, they haven't had. Maybe they have their background, but not for this ma master program. 
That's great. Well, I'll tell you about it because it, it plays into several of the research projects that I've been doing. I mostly work with optimization and simulation. So simulation means, uh, is simulation is a way of handling when we are not sure uh, about some of the inputs to our problem or if we aren't sure what the effects of our, of our actions are going to be, but we have some probability distribution on that. We ask the computer to pretend like that thing happened a hundred times or a thousand times. And each time through, we pick a different random number. So one time this canister has a lot of weapons grade plutonium. And the second time the computer runs it, this canister has less weapons grade plutonium. And the third time it has a different amount. So now we get, as a result, we say, well, as if we ran, as if we mixed all these plutonium stocks together a hundred thousand times, and we say, well, only in 0.1% of those times did we ever have pucks coming out of the machine that could have been made into a nuclear weapon. So we had to not only do this math and figure out how to blend plutonium together so that you could never use it again to make a nuclear weapon. We had to convince the Russians that our, that our technique would work. So a lot of it was about communication. We had to write a report that was convincing about how this method was going to work, even though we didn't know some of the parameters of, of, the, of the inputs. So all that was super exciting for me to work on. And I was really happy that I was applying operations research techniques um, in a way to make the world better. I think that's like always been a theme for me. You know, operations research is the mathematics of making better decisions. And to me, it was really important to define what I meant by better. So another thing I have not been willing to work on in my career is weapons. Um, I don't I don't design weapons. Um, I don't believe in violence. So I have made it a very important part of my career to only use mathematics for good. <laughs> um, so that that was my experience at Stanford. And then I worked at Lawrence Livermore Labs for a little while. Uh, I was an engineer in their um, systems sciences division. So the national labs are doing lots of really cool stuff and they hire people with your kind of training. Uh, there's also, and then after that, I decided that I wanted to go back and get a PhD. So I went to MIT and I was in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, but I was still basically uh, studying operations research. And while I was there, I met my husband, Dory Segev, and Dory is a transplant surgeon. And he, well, I met him swing dancing. So we, we have a very avid hobby of dancing. Um, I don't know if any of you got to watch the movie that Hamid sent out over email, but it does have some clips of us dancing. So if you're curious enough to want to see me dance, then you should go look that up uh, from your email. So when I met Dory, we were dancing together. We were having a great time. We got married. We never thought of collaborating and working together, but actually he has a background in computer science and before he went into medicine and me being in operations research, that meant we could really like talk to each other well about problems. And it was a built-in advantage for me because as an operations research person, there is a huge interest in healthcare applications and in particular in transplantation within operations research. These problems are super cool. The, the, the INFORMS healthcare meeting is really big. It happens every two years and there's a lot of exciting projects going on. But one of the biggest hurdles to making a difference in healthcare is that providers, physicians, it's hard for them to work with operations researchers in general. And it's just, uh, there's, there's so much going on. It's hard to get a physician's attention and it's hard to have enough collaboration with somebody who's actually taking care of patients so that your models are focused on solving the actual problems that clinicians want to solve, right? It's, it's, um, it's fairly simple to write an operations research application in healthcare that doesn't really affect healthcare. That isn't almost isn't about healthcare. That, that does happen sometimes um, where healthcare is like a toy problem. But because I work with Dory, he always brought, brought me problems and handed them to me and said, this is something we really need to do within transplantation. Can you apply operations research techniques to solve it? Um, so I'm gonna tell you about some of those projects. But I wanted to stop and see if anybody 
has any questions or wants to wants to make an observation so far? Okay, great. So I'll go on. I've got this uh, person, these two physicians wrestling over an organ. Because there aren't enough organs for everyone who needs a transplant, there has to be rationing. It's not like in other aspects of healthcare where you can say, well, we should just spend more money on this. There only are so many organs available for transplant and there are more patients that need them. So we do have to use operations research, I think, to um, efficiently distribute the organs to the people who need them the most. So let me just say, uh, no, I'm gonna go on. I'm gonna go on a little bit. So Matt, this is um, people wrestling over a transplant. This is actually real. So I started getting involved in the allocation of livers for transplant. So these are livers from deceased donors. And right now they are distributed within areas that are called regions. And the regions are historical accident. So they are geographic boundaries, kind of like the boundaries of voting districts that were not designed for the purpose of sharing organs fairly. They're just accidents of history of which hospitals happen to be working with each other at which time. And then those lines got set in stone. And now if a deceased donor liver becomes available, it goes to the sickest person within that region. So how sick a person is who has liver disease is measured by MELD, which is the, the model for end-stage liver disease. If you have a higher MELD score, that means you're more likely to die in the next 90 days if you don't get an organ. So you, the goal of distributing livers is to rescue as many people as you can. Some people who have a low MELD score, they can wait a while and maybe get a liver later. But if you have a very high MELD score, your liver is not functioning. And there's no kind of substitute, there's no possible substitute for it. If you have kidney disease and your kidneys fail, you can go on dialysis. And dialysis is like an artificial kidney machine, but there's no artificial li liver machine. So if your liver fails and you can't get a transplant, you will die. And the, the MELD score measures how close you are to that threshold. So the goal of distributing livers ought to be to get them to the people with the highest meld. But what happened was these region lines were drawn in a way that there were a lot more patients needing transplants and a lot fewer livers in some of the regions. And other regions had fewer candidates on the transplant list and they had more livers available. And this had been the status quo for so long that the physicians who were transplanting in those high availability regions really didn't want to give up their access to livers. So what did I do with that problem? Um, so here's a picture of, just, this is just illustrating the problem. This is, uh, they, they did a change which was called SHARE 35. SHARE 35 was, if you have a MELD score above 35, then we're gonna allow the liver to go outside of your local DSA, you know, to a wider a distribution area. The goal was to try to rescue people before they got too sick to survive. But actually you can see that the liver transplant rates stayed unfair in the kind of almost the exact same patterns that they were before. So SHARE 35 was a program that they, that they decided on, but it didn't actually make the situation better. This is before I became involved that they decided to do SHARE 35. And I'll say the old way of making policy within uh, UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing, the old way of making policy was to say, okay, we want to make a change. We want people to get their livers earlier so they don't die on the waiting list. And then someone would just suggest a policy ad hoc. Well, let's share livers for above 35. Well, you know, maybe let's do it this way. System A, system B. And those systems were just made up out of someone's head. And then they would do simulation. So this is one good thing. They would take a policy that somebody made up out of their head and test it using a simulation. So in the simulation, I talked about this before, this means they were drawing random numbers, 
Well, they were drawing random organs that might become available next year and taking random patients and seeing if you used the new allocation rules versus the old allocation rules, does this change make my situation better? So simulation is one way of testing. Uh, it's actually evidence-based policy making so that they are saying, we could change the policy in this way, will it have the outcomes that we want? But even with that, they hadn't been able to fix the problem of geographic disparity. So when I, uh, when I got involved in this, I started to talk to them about, oh, this is actually showing that the same problem was happening in other organs, but it's a different geographic pattern. So the different organs for transplant each have a separate system for how they are allocated and every single one of them needs to be changed to become more fair to people based on where they live. Um, I should say something else about this problem. So the problem right now is if you live in some parts of the country and you need a transplant, you have a very low chance of getting them. But if you live somewhere else, you can easily get a transplant and it's just an accident of where you live However, that immediately becomes, um, it immediately becomes a socioeconomic disparity and a racial disparity because people who have savvy and private insurance can get the information that, hey, you live in California and you need a liver transplant, my medical advice is you should move to Florida. And in fact, someone did ask my husband, sent him an email and said, I live in California and I need a liver transplant. And Dory wrote back and said, do you need to move to Florida and get a transplant? And this person's insurance company paid for them to move. They moved for three months, got a liver transplant and moved back to California, happy and healthy. But people who have Medicaid insurance, Medicaid is tied to your state. You can't go to another state to get a liver transplant. So now because you might be poor or because you might you know, be socioeconomically disadvantaged, you can't afford to move, then you now can't live because the healthcare is, is being sequestered in these, these badly drawn regions. So this was the problem that we wanted to solve using, we're gonna use optimization, which is where I come into the story. So, what I did is just like gerrymandering for political districts, but I did gerrymandering for allocating livers. You can see some borders. These little lines inside here are borders of donation service areas. So I said that the country is broken up into regions. There are 11 regions. And that within those regions, there are smaller little areas called donation service areas. And that's what's outlined here are the donation service areas. What I did was I did redistricting to take some of those donation service areas and link them together and make new regions. This is different from the original region map of the US. In fact, these are regions that are designed, engineered, optimized to balance the supply and the demand for livers in each of those areas. So what I did was I solved a great big math problem and have, have your students been studying optimization? Um, as I said, yeah, last semester we, we had, uh, uh, they had learned some applications of operation research, they learned about that somehow. Did they do um, like optimization within an Excel spreadsheet or did they write like any linear or integer programs? Uh, I mean, I mean, we are started with Excel, then end up lingo. So these two. Uh... Okay, so so this is an optimization problem where the objective, the thing I'm trying to get the most of, is uh, that the livers go to where they're supposed to go. That is as if you had a national um, transplant system. Now you can't. You have still have to have regions. You can't not have regions for livers because the livers have to be transplanted within six hours of when they are recovered. And the recovery itself takes two to three hours. So you can't actually ship an organ from Florida to California or, or, or very rarely would something like that happen. So the livers do have to be allocated um, fairly close to where they're recovered, but they still can travel a long way. So we have to design 
regions. We're still stuck with, you can't send it to the sickest person anywhere in the country, but we're redesigning the boundaries of those regions, just like when they gerrymander a voting district to try to make sure that a Republican will be elected or to try to make sure a Democrat will be elected. In this case, we're trying to make sure that a liver will be available at that moment that you cross into a meld where you're so sick, you're about to die without getting a transplant. And these are, yes? It's like a transplant. It's like a transportation problem? Kind of, I mean, I'm just asking. Well, so most, most operations researchers immediately jump to that it might be like a matching problem where you have a list of organs and you have a list of patients and you want to decide, it's like a bipartite matching. So you wanna draw lines and say which organ goes to which person. But we can't actually solve it that, that way because the organs, it's a dynamic problem. The organs aren't sitting there in a pile and neither are the patients. The patients get sicker or better over time and the organs become available one at a time. So what you get to decide is you have one organ. How are you gonna order the entire list? You have to sort the list of everybody who's waiting for an organ everywhere in the country. So what we did is we tried to decide the people at the top of that list are the people within these districts I designed. So I made sure that within your district, you have encompassed enough of the sick people that the person at the top of the list is a sick person. Otherwise with the old regions, you had a district where nobody there really, really was urgently about to die without the organ, but right over the line in the other district, there was somebody who was very sick and the organ couldn't get to them. Those people were sorted way down on the bottom of the list. Um, so, so this is what we did. We, we used mathematical optimization to design a better map. And then we used simulation to test the map in the same way they had been doing before. In fact, we used the same simulation software that the United Network for Organ Sharing was really comfortable with. But the system that we used for allocating the organs wasn't something somebody just made up. It was designed to solve the problem that they said they were trying to solve. So doing this, made a big difference in the transplant community generally. A lot more physicians became knowledgeable about the existence of operations research and optimizations and people hadn't realized this was even possible, but also forcing people to be very explicit about why are we changing the allocation system and what do we hope to achieve and when, how will we know when we achieved it? So these are, this is about metrics. How do you measure whether you did what you wanted to do? So we, we measured things like the differences between what meld score you had to be to get an organ in these different areas. In one place, you didn't have to be very sick. And in one place, you had to be very, very, very sick. We wanted those to be even so that at, no matter where you lived in the country, if you were getting to be really sick and about to die that you would have access to a liver. Um, and it was really interesting because that changed the conversation. I even was happy, you're gonna be surprised at what I'm happy about. I was happy when someone stood up at one of the meetings and went to the microphone and said, I don't agree with the objective. I don't think we should distribute livers fairly across the US. I think our objective should be to make the most profit. And as much as that, that kind of will shock you, but uh, framing everything out, well, what do we want to solve the problem of unfair access to livers? And enough people did. And it really, it really convinced people. In fact, we got a unanimous vote for this plan within the liver committee. And there was a transplant surgeon in Wisconsin who was at that meeting. And the very next week, my husband Dory went to go give a conference, uh, give a talk at that guy's hospital in Wisconsin. Well, Wisconsin is a place that had previously been advantaged. Wisconsin was getting lots of livers. And yet this surgeon from Wisconsin had voted for our plan. 
And so Dory went to go visit his hospital and he's Dory was talking about this redistricting plan and he said, we got a unanimous vote. And he said, everyone in the room turned to look to the guy who from Wisconsin, who was one of the people who voted for it. And he, he said, he sat there in the meeting and he went, I saw a model that is called killing Wisconsin with math. Um, <laughs> but what he meant was, after looking at the numbers of how many lives would be saved by doing this, he couldn't vote against it. Um, so that was that's the kind of impact that optimization can have. And designing the system to solve the problem rather than um, taking random choices. I think a lot of people use the word optimization in this loose way. The, the lay interpretation of the word optimization is, well, it's better than what we did before. But that's not what I mean. I mean, it's better than any other system you could design of this type. So these are better than any other regions you could have that split the country into eight pieces and we use it for liver allocation. Now, it, it, uh, the design space is also an issue. Like there were some types of, op there were some types of distribution that I didn't consider uh, when I designed this. Um, and it ended up that they chose something slightly different in the long run to, to implement. But the big thing is, even though this was a huge fight, let me see if we go. Um, even though this was a huge fight uh, and lots of people sued the United Network for Organ Sharing over allocation rules because of the work that we started. Basically, we had tried and tried to get redistricting implemented and the committee voted against it. And then a patient sued the United Network for Organ Sharing saying, I should have access to these livers. And they stapled our paper to the lawsuit saying, look, we know they know of a system that does a better job than this. So we were actually evidence in this person's lawsuit, which the United Network for Organ Sharing decided not to fight, but instead to implement an overnight change to their allocation system over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, so this is, this is a picture right now of how optimized redistricting does reduce disparity in liver transplant. What you want is to see all the states be basically the same color. So most people have the same access to a liver transplant. This is the before on the left. We had very different levels of MELD at when you would get a transplant. And on the right, you have most people and most places in the country have equal access to a transplant. And you see California is still red it's really hard to solve California's shortage. If you live in California, you are unfortunately still not able at, to access a liver when you need one. And that's because within the travel distance, there are just so many candidates in, in California and there aren't very many deaths. You know, the death rate in California is like one quarter of what it is in the South. And that's because of demographics. It's because of the kinds of diseases that people die from. Uh, you just, have a very different availability of organs in California compared with other places. And there aren't a lot of places really near California that are population centers to, to give them enough organs. So that's, you know, kind of the, the limit, upper limit of what we could do, unless we could ship livers farther. And there are scientists working on methods of preserving livers longer. So there might be a better solution to this problem in the future. Um, so I'm going to start to talk about something else, but I want to stop and give people a chance to ask questions about redistricting. Uh, I have a question, I mean, regarding a paper I just published for transplantation. Mm -hmm. So my question is that, uh, uh, what if somebody, I mean, we use, uh, predictive analytics to predict several chance of survival before mm. transplantation. What I mean uh, we have the current data and we have one organ and like, uh, uh, let's say 10 potential recipients. And like someone could like, based on our mother would, we guess he, could, he or she could survive more than 10 years. Somebody may die. There's a high chance of dying less than one year. So what, I mean, it, I think it would be very interesting if it's combined with your uh, basically, uh, the way of uh, having unbiased regions, but it might get more complicated because it might be someone who's in the borderline of two regions. And if you, he or she take a, a liver transplant in 
the uh, neighboring region, maybe the chance would be 10 years, uh, I mean, 10 years more than we just consider one region. So I think the patients on the borderline, it, it just makes it more challenging. I'm, I'm not sure if they sue saying that, why you didn't give me that organ in the uh, neighboring city, uh, which I could live like 10 years more. Now, do you mean the their lifetime after they receive a transplant, or do you mean the lifetime if they are unable to get a transplant? Uh, I mean, let's say I'm a uh, potential recipient. I'm in the borderline of two regions, and if I you give me the liver in the neighboring hosp two hospitals in two different regions, in one I can live ten years more than the other region. By using the information before transplantation. Do you mean that it's because it's a better match between the organ and the patient, or you you have a predictive model that predicts someone's lifespan? Yes. Do you predict their lifespan with and without a transplant? Uh, with two different uh, potential organs. Ah, with two different organs. Okay, that's true. That not all the organs are the organs are not identical to each other. So you really do have kind of a matching problem. And yeah, that's that's very complicated. Should you sort patients according to just that patient's characteristics, or should you sort them based on the combination of the patient and the organ? Yes. And yes. it depends on how diff. Yeah, I mean, they just re they just changed the kidney allocation system to do more of that to take the very healthiest organs and make sure they got to the healthiest youngest patients so that the lifespan uh, would be longer. But of course, it, it can be problematic to dis define your objective as maximizing the lifespan of the transplanted organs, because that might lead to only transplanting rich white people. And that would be a bad thing for transplant to be not equitable. So you have to include some sorts of boundaries on, on fairness. And so geographic fairness is what I've been talking about, but there's also gender fairness and racial fairness and all of those things can be incorporated as side constraints into an optimization model. Okay. Thank you. I have a question, can I ask a question? Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. I'm a computer scientist, so I have some computational problem. <laughs> And um, so kidney transplant, you know, matching is one of the, you know, algorithms we discuss in class. So for your problem, I mean, my internet connection was not very good, so I might have missed the information. Um, you talk about the generally the objectives and the general ideas about the constraints. How do you solve it? I mean, <laughs> that's a computational problem. That's a great question. So I, I didn't invent any new solution techniques in what I was doing. I used uh, CPLEX, OPL CPLEX, which is a, an excellent commercial solver. It uses technology called branch and bound for solving integer programs. Is that a good answer? Is that yeah, what that's a good answer. Yes, looking? that's a very yeah. good answer. Thank you. So have I, you yeah. tried a different, you must have tried a different constraints, right? You know, because constraints determine your solution to some extent, yeah. I'm so glad you're asking about this. I mean, I could switch to a more technical slide set. Hamid asked me to not get too technical, but you're tempting me to want to show you some different uh, equation formulations of this model. Some of the equations that I used in the beginning, uh, they had a an objective that included both the distance that the organs travel plus some weight times how fair you're being. So then you have this trade-off, but the problem was when I tried to explain this to the surgeons, they kept saying, well, what's that weight? Why would it be two? Why isn't it three? And why?" And, and the trade-offs that the program was making weren't very transparent to the decision makers. So I reformulated it and I used actually a definition of compactness from Mark Daskin's book, System Science. And this meant that uh, it was a little bit of a conservative criterion. So it cut out maybe some feasible solutions, but that was all right. And I'm, now I made the objective be just the number of organs that went to the wrong place. So it had an interpretable unit. It wasn't just like 
703 badnesses that I was trying to reduce. It was, there are 800 organs out of the 6,000 available that ended up in a region that's not where they should have been versus here's a better solution where only 100 organs are misdirected. So like making, reformulating my problem so that I had interpretable objectives and constraints was really important. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I'll look, I mean, I look for your papers too. It's very interesting. Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll make sure that um, they can go out in another email then. Thank you. Other questions? I guess I can ask another question. Sure. So do you have any information about like the, I, I, this is overall more broader type of information, kind of the number of people that get saved by your program compared to the other old system? Mm -hmm. So liver transplant is specialty care. Only about six to 7,000 patients a year get a liver transplant and about 15 or 1,600 die waiting. We talked about saving a, roughly 100 of those lives. So it's a pretty big dent when you think about the problem. It feels sometimes people would say, oh, what, you know, it's only a hundred lives. It's not that much, but that's a pretty big dent in the size of the problem. Right. Um, you know, plus the aspect of that folks should have trust in the transplant system. They should be able to look at it and say it's operating in a fair way. That okay. is like an unquantifiable benefit. Right, right. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry that I, you're totally right. I should have mentioned that earlier. No, I, no, I would like okay. to you have so much information. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to talk about another model next, if there are no other questions. And um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is actually older in my career. Um, and this happened when I was a graduate student. And my husband was a transplant fellow. So both of us were like trainees. And Dory came, I went to go pick Dory up from the hospital one day. And in the time it took us to drive home, which was about eight minutes, he explained this kidney exchange problem to me. And then we worked on it for the next 10 years. And it really jumpstarted both of our careers in this direction. So this is a paper. This was the first paper that I ever published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So for a graduate student and a transplant fellow to publish a paper in this journal was a pretty big splash to make. Uh, so the kidney exchange problem was if you have a donor who wants to give a kidney to you, but they're the wrong blood type, and then you found another family that had a donor that was the wrong blood type, you might be able to exchange those organs. So you circumvent the incompatibility so that um, both people actually get a compatible transplant from a stranger, but it's really that their loved one donated so that they could receive a transplant. And our paper was the first paper to appear in the medical literature about using mathematics to decide who should exchange. Because, um, so at Hopkins, they were doing a whole lot of desensitization transplants. Desensitization was like medically cutting edge where you would take somebody whose kidney was the wrong blood type and force the recipient to accept it using desensitization, removing antibodies from their blood and it was high tech and they were on different kinds of drugs. And because Hopkins had a program that did that, they also had a huge list of patients who had incompatible living donors. And they were trying to set up an exchange where they could exchange these incompatible donors they were literally doing it in the, in the office, in the coordinator's office with a magnet board and like moving people with different blood types around trying to figure out who was exchangeable with whom. And Dory said that he said to his boss, Robert Montgomery, who's on this paper too, hey, we should have, instead of just doing this at Hopkins, we should get every patient in the whole entire country who has a living donor to exchange with someone else. And uh, his boss said, you could never do that. There's no way you could figure out who should exchange with whom. Like there's just way too many people, right? They won't fit on my magnet board. And so he immediately brought that problem to me and said, we need to do a nationwide exchange. And this paper is the result of that. But unfortunately we didn't have any data. 
this paper was published with no data at all. And that's because we used simulation. We had fake patients in this study that we published. We generated random patients and their whole family members, including inheriting blood types and inheriting human leukocyte antigen types to decide who was uh, compatible with whom in their family. Is this mother going to be able to donate to this child? Is this cousin going to be able to donate to this father, et cetera? So we had, we had virtual patients, but they had very similar blood types and HLA types to the real population of people who were out there without a donor. And we didn't know who they were because at this point, kidney exchange was illegal. The Department of Justice had said that because you aren't allowed to exchange an organ for a valuable consideration, that you can't trade your blood type B kidney to get a blood type A kidney. That's like, a, here, I'll give you my kidney if you give me mine. That was a trade, that was an exchange. So technically, they were doing a few um, exchange transplants here and there, but technically the Department of Justice said they were illegal. So the United Network for Organ Sharing couldn't set up a nationwide exchange and nobody was keeping track of those patients at all. If you came forward and you said, hey, my, my spouse wants to donate to me, the doctor would just say, well, they're the wrong blood type. And then they went home and nobody wrote that data down. So we had to use simulation to invent a bunch of vir virtual patients to replace the fact that we didn't have any actual data. But we predicted that thousands of additional kidney transplants would happen. And this was this contradicted an earlier paper that said that a kidney exchange would only ever be relevant to like 2% or 3% of the population. That wasn't true at all. Half of the pairs that had an incompatible donor could find a compatible donor. Um, and so we, we published this paper and I'll tell you a little bit more about the mathematics of what we did. So we represented all of the patients and their incompatible donors as a graph. This is a graph, it's not the kind of graph that you might be familiar with like X versus Y graph, but this actually has, we call each of these circles um, vertices. So one is a vertex and zero is a vertex and 11 is a vertex and each vertex is actually a patient and a living donor that wants to donate to them, but can't. But the donor in vertex one can donate to the recipient in vertex four. And the donor in vertex four can donate to the recipient in vertex zero. And the donor in vertex zero can donate to the recipient in vertex one. You can see if you make a triangle between zero, one, and four, that three patients who couldn't get a transplant before can all get transplanted. So that's a cycle in the graph from zero, one, four. And we looked for maximum cycle decompositions. So we tried to find what's the largest number of cycles you can get that is the largest number of people who can get transplanted in this graph. Um, you can see there are some two-way cycles like the donor in 11 can give to seven and the donor in seven can give to the recipient in 11. So that's just two way exchange. Um, a good example of like a paper that was cool in operations research, but had not made an impact clinically, it did not make an impact in medicine, was an earlier paper on exchange in which they, they tried to do um, cycles of any length. So um, they, the, this, this paper had come out before ours and it was, and it said you can do top trading cycles, which meant that in practice that you would get a cycle where maybe 15 or 30 people would exchange in a big, big loop. And so you give to one person, they give to the next person, they give to the next person, and it takes 30, 30 links before you get back to the starting person. And that wasn't considered feasible in, in medicine because every one of those patients might get sick one day or the donor becomes pregnant and then 30 people don't get a transplant. So it was too brittle um, to use that kind of a system. You had to actually solve the problem with a maximum cycle length. It may be like no more than two people can exchange or maybe no more than three, but you couldn't do really big cycles. Um, and this is, this is where the state of the art was when I got involved in this problem. And so we wrote a paper about just using two-way cycles, but using optimization 
to say, even if you had a thousand families and they're incompatible donors, you can quickly with a computer figure out who exchanges with whom so the most people can get a transplant. Uh, and that, that really changed things. So, oh, I guess I do have a formulation slide in here. This was a, a I think this is a cycle formulation. Yeah, this is a cycle formulation. Again, there are multiple different ways to write down the mathematics of finding the optimal exchange on here. And there's a lot of cool operations research work still being done about different ways to write down those equations so that it might be easier to compute the solution for really big problems, or so that you might be able to incorporate side constraints better. Um, but in any case, this is like one of the simplest ways you can write this problem down, is you say that you have a variable one up to capital N, where there's capital N of those cycles, one variable for each cycle, and then you make the variable one if you pick the cycle and you make the variable zero if you don't pick the cycle, and then the computer tells you which cycles you should pick. Okay, so let me go on here. So for example, you running that integer program on the graph I showed you earlier shows that you can get six out of these 12 people transplanted if you pick the right exchanges. Um, but the impact of our work really was in changing the law. Because we wrote a paper showing how many thousands of transplant patients could benefit, we were able to get the attention of Congress and lawmakers passed a bill in 2007 saying that they had never intended to ban kidney pair donation or kidney exchange. And so henceforth kidney exchange was explicitly legal this only happened because we made up data and we used, our, we used the computer, we used simulation to show exactly what a big impact this would make. There wouldn't have been any other way to show that uh, before the thing was legal. So that is something that I'm proud of is being able to provide the kind of evidence through the research that I do that can change policy, that can change the world for the better. So we changed the way that United Network for, for Organ Sharing makes its allocation policies. And we changed a law to make kidney exchanges legal uh, through the work that we did. So uh, that's the kind of difference you can make with math. And that was the last thing that I have on my slide set. I would love to answer questions. Hi, Professor, can I have a question? Uh, so I actually have a question. I probably missed something about the first picture of the vertices. So I saw some vertices like five, six, three, they are not in that cycle. Does that mean like they're neither donor or recipient? Well, that means that they, they are a donor who was unable to donate to any of the other 12 recipients or they're a recipient who can't receive from any of the 12 donors or both if there was a, a circle completely isolated. So what you saw, those were from realistic distributions. If you include just um, incompatible pairs, there are a lot of pairs that won't find a match. There are ways around that problem. If you incorporate compatible pairs, that is, I'm a person who could donate directly to my sister. But instead of donating directly to my sister, I decide to join an exchange and I donate to somebody else and somebody else donates to my sister. If we had enough compatible pairs who also joined the exchange, then we could get a lot more people transplanted. And so those are the kind of variations that grew later when people were comfortable with kidney exchange, we realized we could get a higher percentage of people matched. Oh, I see. So those people are excluded from that cycle will later on have have some donors right have some red match right hopefully the anyone who is in a circle there it means they have someone who is willing to donate their kidney and it means oh. that they are ready to receive but we just have to find the right um exchange opportunity for them oh, i see thank you very much uh hi professor Dintry. can i ask a question uh, thank you very much for your sharing. It's really informative. Uh, I have a, a question, maybe a little weird. Uh, uh, let me say, uh, if we 
we got a lot of successful matching, which means insurance company and hospital may cost a lot of money for their health, for their treatment. And have you meet any, I mean, difficulty, difficulties to get the, those uh, data from the hospital? I mean, have they, have you ever met those difficulties? Uh, yeah, <laughs> healthcare finance is a disaster in our country. Um, when we were doing the liver transplant problem, I wanted to figure out what were the financial incentives for the transplant centers. And we could figure out how much the company, how much the hospital billed for each of the liver transplants. But we couldn't figure out how much it cost the hospital to deliver that care. So we didn't really have a good sense of like, are the hospitals profiting more from this patient than from that patient? I mean, liver transplants generally profitable. So they probably were making money on all of them, but we, we just, we couldn't sort that out in the slightest because that's considered proprietary data. The hospitals won't tell you how much profit they're making on different yeah. things. Um, with, it, with the kidney problem, every single kidney transplant saves the US government half a million dollars. Oh, and that's wow. because every single patient who needs to be on kidney dialysis it costs almost $100,000 a year to deliver dialysis and every single patient is on Medicare. So, um, so that, that was really motivating for the government to do something about helping people get a more kidney uh, transplants. But you know, they're still doing a lot of really dumb stuff like because you're on Medicare when you have a kidney failure, but after you get a transplant, you don't have kidney failure. So you drop your Medicare coverage and then people can't pay for their immunosuppressive therapy and then they reject their transplant and then they go back on dialysis and medicare and it is just the dumbest cycle on earth that we need to change if you are on medicare and you get a kidney transplant you need to save at least your your immunosuppressive drug coverage so we're still working on that one uh, yeah thank you so much Uh, hello, Professor. May I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so the circle, that, I mean, the graph that you showed, you, you, you told that like you didn't have any data, rather you work on it, uh, taking some uh, data uh, or some imagination. So how do you actually bring the patients under a common platform? I mean, the donor and the recipients, is there any system to bring them together nationwide or it's, it varies from state to state? There are a few different nationwide exchanges. The one that has done the most kidney exchanges is called the National Kidney Registry. And it's run by my friend Garrett Hill in New York. He has done a lot of innovative things with it, like allowing patients to donate their kidney now to give their, their loved one a voucher that they can exchange later. So you may know, like a grandparent, has a grandchild and the grandchild has a disease that means maybe in 10 years that grandchild needs a transplant. The grandparent donates a kidney now to someone and the grandchild gets a voucher they can turn in years later possibly. So the, you know, it's, it's gotten to be very exciting. Anyway, there, uh, there is also a United Network for Organ Sharing has an exchange. Several hospitals run their own regional or national exchanges in general, pa patient pairs are able to sign up to many exchanges. So it's been a very interesting story in the US. In Europe, there are some national exchanges and there are a lot of efforts to get countries together to make transnational exchanges. I even saw in the newspaper about an exchange between a Palestinian family and an Israeli family in the Middle East. So that was kind of a cool story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Hi, Professor. That was a super, super fascinating uh, talk. Um, I'm an MSGIS candidate um, and an undergraduate in the econ uh, department. And so um, a bit of a, a tangent, I suppose, but I'm working on an optimization model for transit um, in, in uh, the WRTA. And so I was wondering if um, you'd be interested in, in um, perhaps having a conversation at a later point in time to um, get your thoughts on that. <laughs> um, obviously, to whatever your availability is. Um, 
but yeah, I'm working because I was um, I work at the local model. I was quote told was it's your grandmother's recipe for bus stops. And I was like that. No, there's a better way to do this. And so <laughs> I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Oh, heaven. I mean, transportation problems, transit is such a great thing to be working on. I am thrilled to hear that you're working in transit. Uh, and I don't know a ton about the models, honestly. They can be quite different from the types of optimization models that I've done. Of course, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to you about it. And like I said, just congratulations on picking something that is going to make the world a better place. If, if transit works for people, and that's life changing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I was maybe a few minutes late. I'll get your information from um, the program. Thank you so much. Yes, sure. Feel free to contact me. You can all find me very easily. Just Google my name and you'll see my email address and go ahead and I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. What a fun time this has been. I, I enjoy getting to share my models, but like it's also really fun to hear about what you all are working on. Does anybody else want to share what your favorite application or future plans are? Uh, I mean, in transplantation area, I'm, uh, me and my students have, uh, have, I mean, I've worked in two different projects. One of them about, uh, I mean, as I said, the score for uh, transplantation. The second one is bias in transplantation. So we want to see if there is bias based on gender, region, and also what happens if you use machine learning and uh, like you end up having a score a more uh, complicated score. And what happens if you use that score for transplantation? Does it improve bias or unbiased? And uh, in terms of COVID, we're also doing a simulation project uh, about uh, how we can, imp I mean, uh, helps in terms of spread of uh, contagious virus such as COVID-19 in the like a supermarket or some place that people gather together. I've seen some of the students working at that bias uh, in transplantation here. Uh, there are like three or four students. They're all of them in this talk. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Thank Okay, well, I think maybe people are worried that we're we're at our time limit and I've really appreciated the chance to visit you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very Thank much. You, very, a very inspiring talk. Uh, it inspired me a lot, gave me some ideas. And so, uh, the students are watching your video. They, I give them a homework out of your video. So some of them are, I mean, different countries. So they watch your video later and I promise not a difficult homework, but there's a homework from your talk. So, and I, they gave me some like comments, private comments. All of them are very uh, thankful of you. Very good talk and you honored us. It's really good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Bye.